Hey, You're John. Live. How are hey, you? What's up, Carl Cohen? Not much. Just hanging out. So uh, Waiting over here? Here we are. This is the Bulkley Report 2.0. You must be very excited. I'm excited. We've been talking about this for how long now? Uh, how many years? A few. A <laughs> few. <laughs> One, two, eight, right? Yeah, something like that. So before we dive into all that, first and foremost, we'd like to give a thanks to Mike Grande of Rock Out Loud, mm-hmm. Lisa Marie of Hungry Hippo Eats, and uh, Nicole Baroda of Jersey Cookie Girl and Rove Transportation. Thanks. Thanks to all of them. So, John, for those who don't know you, which I know you find hard to believe. It's really hard for me to believe. Tell, tell us, who is John Buckley? Uh, John Buckley is a watch dealer who has uh, been doing this since the mid-90s. And uh, I made a lot of friends, made a few enemies, and sold a lot of watches. And did some other stuff, too, but I'm sure you'll get into that. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on some of that. <laughs> I'm um, sure we will. So I I don't know if you remember the first time we met at all or not and sort of how we we arrived I know it was at 37 West. I know we were in the window, and I know we were doing big vintage business over there, I remember. If I remember, with Danny and Michael, with Renaissance. That's accurate. At the time, I just started sort of getting Mm -hmm. into vintage, uh, started collecting mainly with 1675 GMT Masters, which, you know, is all the rage these days. Yes. Anyway, uh, I was looking for a dial for a project of mine, so I stroll into 37 West, all, you know, bright-eyed, starstruck. You have these beautiful pressure testers in the window, a window full of all these vintage watches you only see in the books and stuff at the time. And I sort of chat you up, and I'm looking uh, for a dial. Mm Mm-hmm. I've got to say, you weren't the most welcoming or friendliest guy, which I, I, I've, I've heard that's yeah. uh, sort of the same reception others yes. have gotten. I learned a lot from Big Mike, the original Mr. Nasty. And uh, I do. Did I throw you out? Well, I, I asked you for some dials, and it was sort of like, what do you want? And, <laughs> oh, well, do you have any? How much are they? Next thing I know, he's like pulling this stack of trays out, right? There's probably like five trays of 1675 <laughs> dials. For those of you who are into this now and collecting, it's like, you're lucky if you go find one Matt dial, yeah. right? And you probably had 50 or 60 of yeah. them. So I'm like, oh, cool. Can I buy <laughs> one? How much are they? <laughs> and John's like, $1,600. Not and bad. And I'm like, uh, okay, um, why? Like, that that mm-hmm. doesn't sound right at all. The watch is 3500 You go, fine, you don't want it? I don't care. So next thing I know, Sounds I leave. Sounds right. <laughs> don't don't think much of it. Uh, fast forward about four or five years, I'm on Vintage Rolex Forum, uh, and I reconnect with John, who at the time is operating under the handle the real John Buckley and the house yeah. homie. There's there's a reason for that, but go ahead. No, I'd like to hear it now. Please the tell The reason us. for that was Richard Carver, who was the original owner of Vintage Rolex Forum, was just, uh, I don't recall what it was that prompted it, but Richard made everybody pull their company names off. And my name had always been online, Tuscany Rose. And he was just being a hard ass with me because Richard would do that sometimes. I like Richard and Richard liked me, but Richard had to, you know, he always used to say like vintage Rolex forum was like herding cats. And he's right. It was just a bunch of wild guys in the beginning. And he had to be like the voice of reason. And I don't recall what happened. There was some kind of change in policy with, with um, I feel, what was that, Network 54 or something like that. And you couldn't use it as a commercial venture or mm-hmm. something. I don't know. Whatever the case was. He made everybody change their handles. So, I mean, Eric Koo, who wound up owning the forum, forum was always Fu Man Koo. So he got to keep his handle. I had to change Tuscany Rose to uh, the real John Buckley, uh, whatever it was, homie. Uh, you remember that. That's yeah, pretty good. in the house. In so. the house, homie. I just wanted a big, long thing just to be a jerk. It was hard typing that out on my yeah. notes, trust me. I'm sure it was. I'm so sure it was. I remember when we met that day, I bought a two-tone Air King from you. Really? Uh for $1,100, which at the time was pretty fair for the market. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so over that sort of course and thereafter, you know, I started hanging out Mm -hmm. a little more. We did some business. That was at um, 66 West. 66 West, where you are now, and Mm -hmm. hanging out, getting some knowledge. And around that time, I learned about uh, the Buckley dial and then sort of delved back into the forums and Mm -hmm. started reading 
uh, the Buckley Report, which mm-hmm. started in about 2007 or yeah. so. And no, it was early. Wasn't it a little early? 2006, Six, seven. Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar, like, how would you describe the Buckley Report? I have my own thoughts <sighs> and opinions. but The Buckley Report was just a troll page. Not a troll page, but it turned into one because everybody was hyping the market like they're doing now. And I was always one to, to like a very, very soft market. That was my thing. I always look at the downside of things. So my thing was to put out real information that I would figure out based on, you know, world markets and, you know, just dealers and auction houses. Back then it was a little it, it was a little easier to read than it is now. So I would put out all of this stuff and guys just did not like anyone like downplaying the market because everybody was making money. I mean, we all made money. OK, mm-hmm. it's not a question of, you know, whether we did or we didn't. We all did. And they did not like some of the things that I was, you know, putting out there. And I mean, I know I don't know if you're going to get into some of them or not, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of the stuff that I said when I was, you know, predicting, I, I, it wasn't really a prediction. It was more, you know, it was just a market analysis. And most of the time it was pretty spot on. Because nobody really wanted to, you know, put a, you know, put a pin in the balloon. Mm-hmm. But the pin was, the balloon was there and the pin was on its way and it wound up happening. And, you know, once the market crashed, what year was that? That was eight? Yeah, I mean, that, like you're that? right in there, like, you know, 2007, late, like yeah. September into 2008. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's interesting because I think there are a lot of parallels to perhaps where we are today. You know, yeah. you've seen... A lot of change in the market in a very mm-hmm. quick time and sort of as you alluded to you were giving this market analysis um, that was very helpful I think to a lot of people mm-hmm. but a lot of people didn't necessarily like yeah. uh, what you had to say probably because of their own self-interest but as you said like no one likes the guy in the room no. who's sort of gloomy and so forth um, which <laughs> you're that guy I'm that guy so um, anyway, you know, there, there's some like really interesting reports you wrote. With you some, actually went back and... I, I spent some time and went back and wow. actually read this stuff. And wow. It's sort of shocking. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I I'm do I'm very read. impressed. You do. No, I'm not impressed that you read. I'm impressed that you took the time out of your busy schedule to sit there and actually do that when I wouldn't do that. And I, I've got to say, it's it's funny because mm-hmm. someone interacting with you, like you, you actually wrote pretty well. Yeah, I'm really good with a pen. I'm really, really good with a pen, and I can sit here and spit all day long, and I'm really good with grammar. I was a very good student, Carl. You should know that. Yeah, that's right. That's helpful. (laughs) So what what I thought would be sort of good to do is uh, just go back to some sort of commentary you had and see how you feel about it now and maybe see see how it relates today. Let's go. Um, So... It's sort of interesting going back to like October 2007 mm-hmm. for those who don't really remember what was going on or maybe didn't follow and was, as we sort of alluded to earlier. There was a lot going on mm-hmm. in the watch world then, but a lot going on um, in the world and financial yeah. markets as well then. Um, so just hitting on some points that you sort of talked about is you were starting to see some things soften at this mm-hmm. point. Um you were calling for things to soften. That mm-hmm. necessarily wasn't the case, but you weren't necessarily believing the hype or what right. was going on. Um, some interesting reference points, particularly for people who see stuff today, is like, for instance, you said a floating cosmograph is another one which is grossly overpriced. With the proper provenance, 20 to 25K for a full boat is correct. The rest will tumble. tumble. Remember, folks, the prices that will withstand this correction or the sound solid pieces. Mm-hmm. So, like, what what's this floating cosmograph today? Oh, man. I, I guess a floating cosmograph, I mean, with or without papers, I mean, look, you got to figure the dial in black is probably a ten dollars to $15,000 dial plus another $15,000 watch plus a bezel, which is going to be a 200-meter bezel, which, I mean, you're talking somewhere between forty and fifty grand, or let's say thirty-five to fifty, based on condition, papers, and stuff like that. I mean, I, I guess that's where it would be today. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that there are some that are way more than that if you go on, you know, some of those retail sites and things like that. But I mean, I wouldn't be comfortable paying 55, 60 grand for one of those without papers. And I'm sure you wouldn't either. No, I certainly you know? wouldn't. No, but that's, I know. that's not sort of my game. In no, business, mine neither. So. 
Um, you know, fast forward a little to like the fall of 2018. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you recall sort of what was going on and your take on the market at the time? I remember when when everything when the market took that big dip and everybody started panicking. And prices just went, it was just there was that big omega auction. I forget what it was. What was that Revolution Omega some I don't it's like right, omega those, but yeah. it was one of those, you know, omega things. And that thing just like pulled numbers that were just ridiculously high. And I was just waiting for everybody to start, you know, once everybody started, the the market started rippling, we start getting phone calls from people. I know you do. I know I do. And it's like, oh, hey, I want to sell this. And then they start off with like some kind of crazy number. And, you know, we'll be like, no, it's not for me, this and that. But after a while, they'll keep coming back. And when they started coming back and you saw that they were looking to sell and looking to dump, it was kind of like a stock market play. You knew that it was just going to fall. And when it all kind of went south, we, we had ourselves in, in one of those very, very like a, like a scared market and nobody wanted to spend any money. And I remember, I, I think it was Min came in and he had a black um, Zenith Daytona. And I think he wanted like 6,500 bucks for it or something like that. And I passed on it because that's how soft the market mm-hmm. had become. I mean, looking back on it, it was insane. But at that time, you didn't know whether or not it was going to just keep going south or not. You know, I mean, listen, when I first started in the business in 94, 95, 96, you couldn't buy a Zenith Daytona for from an AD, just like you can't buy a regular Daytona now. And the Zenith back then, I think it was like seven grand. Or six grand from an AD, you'd buy it for seven. And we thought it was going to start going back to like, you know, right around that kind of number. But nobody wanted to touch anything. Everybody wanted to hold on to whatever cash they had. Nobody wanted to get it, you know, speculate at this point. Mm -hmm. And I know the guys that were holding on to Newman's, um, you know, they, they wound up, whoever held on to them wound up making a fortune. But a lot of the guys, I mean, we were trading more of those back then than ever. You know, from 2008 until 2013, 14, I think that's when I traded more of them than the previous few years or the few years after that. It was just, you know, it was just crazy. Right. And as you sort of alluded to and referenced, you know, the market was in a free fall. And mm-hmm. it was, I, you know, from what I recall, a time of panic. I mean, yeah. I remember I sold a 1675 at the time that I thought was the height of the market for $5,800 mm-hmm. the day before we crashed. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, it was a nice example. Yeah. And then you fast forward, you know, into like October of 2008. And as you said, we're in this free fall. Mm-hmm. Everyone's panicking. They're afraid. No one wants to backstop the market mm-hmm. because these watches are falling yeah. literally daily, it yeah. seemed like. So you had a post on the 24th. That was titled "Will Today Be Black Friday," which ah, is sort of interesting. Really? Yeah, was I mean, it a Friday? <laughs> uh, I'm not good enough at math to oh, go back and check, okay. but okay. anyway, you get a pass. yeah, I get a pass. You get a pass Thank on you. That. So this is interesting. You said while many were watching the stock market fluctuate Thursday, a very important event occurred at my booth in New York City. A known dealer offered me a plastic Daytona for under twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I did not buy it. To all who believe the watch market is impervious to a world financial decline, think again. The writing is on the wall. On a day where shareholders are selling off stocks like Exxon, Home Depot, etc., what makes you think the double Red Sea dweller or the 6263 are immune? Fasten your Mm seatbelts. That was pretty well written. Yeah, that was good. I like that. Fast forward like six days later, you're Mm -hmm. at a IWJG Mm -hmm. show, which at the time was like a pretty lively and happening event. Mm-hmm. There was real business going on. Yes. And you commented that at this show, um, things had taken a pretty quick turn mm-hmm. in such a short period of time. I know you highlighted that people were coming to you, like selling mm-hmm. and really looking to sell. And then there was another group of people who weren't really selling, and you said these were people who had retail clients and who were yeah. still selling to privates. Yeah. Um, but it seemed like at that time there was a lot of product you said people were bringing to you, asking yeah. you to flip before mm-hmm. the show or at the show, and just nothing was happening. Nothing was there happening. There was no traction. I remember the show. I remember it. It was, you know, it, it, look, the market is very fluid, and it can go up, it can go down, and a lot of guys want to believe the hype. And the hype is what gets you in a lot of trouble. 
if you believe it and you put all your eggs in that basket. And I've never been one to do that. I, I, I'm fast and loose in a lot of ways, but I always watch the market. And I always play really close to the vest with this stuff because, I mean, you know, they're watches. And they can go out of vogue real quick. Just as fast as they came in, they will go out. There's always that steady market of people that are always looking to buy them. But the hype people, the people that are putting them on a credit card, the people that are, you know, buying them as, you know, on, as an investment, which is the worst thing in the world to do if you don't know the market, to just go out there and start, you know, buy a Newman for three or $400,000 and, you know, well, you know, now I want to sell it a month later. You know, when I sell somebody a 6263 or a 6265 or any kind of plastic Daytona, it's like, look, this is a ten, five to 10 year play if you really want to make money. I have never seen them go down and stay down. They have always come back. Even, well, you're going to go right, like after the crash, you see where we are now. I mean, those watches that were, you know, the Paul Newmans that were maybe 90 grand are 250 at this stage of the game. Sure. So, you know, but it took a long time, you know, for that to happen. It's not like it happened overnight. It's a five to 10 year play. And that's what you have to be ready for in this, in this game. You know, it's a big boy game. Right. Right. And it's interesting thing happened around this time too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like you were pretty heavy in watches. You were stocking a lot of these watches, mm -hmm. your six, two, six threes, your big crowns, mm -hmm. your Zenith, things like that. Mm -hmm. And you publicly commented that I'm out of the watch game. Really? I'm in parts. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember that. No, I know. Maybe you were, you know, looking out for your own self-interest. I don't know. Oh, I probably was. Mm -hmm. I'm but, good for that. But you, co <laughs> you, you commented that you were out of the wa watch business yeah. and focusing in on What year parts. was that? This was 2008, October of 2008. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, well, I, I like parts. I've always liked parts. Parts are much easier to deal than watches. You know, the watch game, after 2008, we traded a lot of big watches, and the margins were good, but the risk factor was always there. You never knew what was going to happen, you know, if there was any kind of hiccup in the market. So, I mean, um, I play it safe with watches. I don't like to be, you know, buried in a couple of big pieces or, you know, buried in any amount of watches. I'd rather be buried in parts. And the parts market has always been strong. It, it kind of slips and slides with the, the watch market. But, I mean, when somebody needs something, they're going to need it. You know? sure. And you know this as well as I do. When they need it, they're going to pay for it. And if it's a one-off item, it's a one-off item. You know? And you're going to set your mark and you set your, your amount and they're going to either meet it or it's going to sit in your safe for another couple of years, which stuff sometimes does. Right. You know? But to sit, sit on parts is an easy thing. Because it's always going to sell sooner or later. There are enough real collectors in the world, not just people that are just jumping into this game, that, that will keep, you know, it'll keep the value somewhat stable. You know? Right. And, and that's the good thing about the parts market. Yeah. So I mean, I'm glad I is. said that. Yeah. I don't so remember it's, that. I guess you've really stuck to it. Yeah, I did. Um, Certainly. The other thing you highlighted on that's really fun here is um, you sort of commented how you like to deal with this sort of select group of people. Yes. It seems that you, you <laughs> often get a little annoyed or agitated by yes. repeated questions, yes. lots of photos and yes. things. Is that, is that accurate? Very accurate. Very accurate. No, I, I look, I deal with 12 people. That's what I always say. Of course, there's a few more, but it's the same 12 people that I deal with on a regular basis now for years. And every once in a while, I'll deal with somebody new. And look, the deal is, if you want something, know that you want it. I'm not here for you to come and kick tires. I'm not going to send you 100 pictures unless I know you're serious. Okay, if it's somebody that I know and they want 100 pictures, I'll send them 101. Okay, but if it's one of these deals where like somebody's just like, oh, you know, uh, do you have this and this and this? It's like, okay, I don't know you. You know, who who referred you? You know, are you serious about buying? You know, I'm not going to say it to them, but I'll call the other person up and I'll say, hey, do you know this joker? Right. You know, are right. they serious? Are they, you know, are they ready to, to write a check, send a wire, hand me a bag of money? And if they say yes, then I'm all in. If they say, well, you know, he was looking around for this thing, I'll be like, okay, no, I don't have it. And have a nice day. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how it works. You know, I, look, you know, you're with me most of the time. You see how many texts and Facebook uh, you know, messengers and DMs and stuff that I get. 
It's like. So is this like a soft apology to all the people you sort of ignore via text and? No, phone I just call? I ignore everybody sometimes. I just do. You know, sometimes I don't have the time to answer everything. It's like you get guys that you know. Oh, do you have a hand for uh, you know a quick set thirty thirty five? It's like, yeah, I've got a hundred hands. How much time is it going to take me to go out there find one in my box and put it in an envelope and sell it to you? How much am I going to charge you for that? You well, know, I'm yeah. not going to I'm not going to overcharge you. You know, and it's not worth much more than a few bucks. So it's like sometimes the time is more important than actually making the sale. Because in that time, I could do something right, productive. Right, like think about lunch for 45 minutes and agonize over what you may want. Yes, that's right. And, and then we do not that arrive daily. at anything. And then you're like, oh, I'll just go to Pratt Listen, and things like by that. By 2, 3 o'clock, we are eating in that office, okay, for the most part. <laughs> we are definitely eating. You know it and I know it. So, you know, it's usually a couple of hour thing. But lately, me and Danny have been very... Very agreeable on Right, which is sort of funny. We're <laughs> digressing a little bit. You're a uh, vegan now, I've heard. Big vegan. <laughs> How's big, that big going? Vegan. Um, it's really hard to, like, manage the starch with the protein. It's like a real balancing act. It's hard. I'm still working on it. It's only been, like, five weeks, but my inflammation is down. I feel better. So is that harder or dealing with uh, repeated questions about watches? <laughs> it's much harder to deal with questions about watches. How about Vegan birthier is, watches? No, we don't do birthier watches. We don't get involved in that. So and I tell anybody that, that calls me up with that, find it somewhere else. Don't tell me you need something from a specific serial number because it's not the case. If you want something that is on your birthday, <laughs> you know, with papers, good luck finding it. Go out there. You should have, somebody should have bought it for you when you were born. That's a birthier watch. Not one of these things where, well, you know, I need something from 1972 and I'll take a 4 million serial or a three, four, 2 million serials. Like, give me a break. It's like, go get a life. Do something with your life. Go, 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 you know, kick rocks. I'm not, I'm not getting involved in that. So hypothetically, if someone found a watch dated with their actual birthday, would you accept that as a birthday watch? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, no. Well, what happens is you tell somebody, look, a birthday watch is something that you get on your birthday. Okay? Your birthday, there's only one birthday that you have. It's the day that you're born. So your parents go out and buy you a watch dated that day. That is a birth year watch. Okay, if you're trying to like backtrack on that, it's just, you know, you're spinning your wheels. So Put your like, money into something better. So recently you celebrated the anniversary of your birth that it wasn't actually your birthday. Is that what you're saying? I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not big on my birthday or I, I'm not, I, I live it every day. You know, I'm not you know, big on once a year celebrations. I celebrate every day when my feet hit the floor, I'm happy. Okay. If I make it to the end of the day and I make it to bed, I'm happy. And I wake up the next day. It's like every day is my birth. Every day is Christmas. Every night's New Year's Eve. Only I don't stay up until midnight. I'm in bed by 11. Turn into a pumpkin if oh, you yeah. stay up. Bad news. My wife is sitting there. She knows. She yells at me because I can't stay up past like 1055. This is true. Yes, it is. <laughs> so we, we talked a little bit sort of about the market then, and mm -hmm. I think we're at an interesting place mm -hmm. in the market today. Obviously, a lot's changed in yes. the last 10 to 12 years mm -hmm. um, in terms of pricing, but I think as well as information, what's available and out there, mm -hmm. and then the whole sort of influence of social media, whether yeah. it's blogs, Big. a you know Buckley report like we're doing now. Yes. Um, videos, Instagram and mm -hmm. the like. And, you know, what, what do you think all this means and what impact is it having and what do you see it doing to the market in the short term? It brings a lot of fringe players in. A lot like it was back in 06 and 07 before the big downfall. I mean, it brings all the fringe players in. It brings the guys in that, you know, they want to do financing or they want to, you know, it, it's just, there's a lot of big companies out there that finance, which is a great thing. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but it, it's just a different kind of buyer. You know, you've got a, a buyer that's going online, looking at macro pictures, making a decision on whether or not something is real or not, when you can't do that in the big watch game. You really can't. You have to look at things up close and personal in your hand and know what you're buying. I mean, you know. I mean, the, Arthur and Billy over here are perfect examples of guys who do not buy anything without really examining it and making sure that it is 100% what they know it's supposed to be. But you've got guys that, you know, 
there's a lot of guys out there with money, that young guys with money, and that's great, you know, but they're buying stuff. I mean, I had a guy come in, I don't know if you were there yesterday. I don't want to mention his name. You were there, and this person had a really bad experience with a big watch house many years ago. That's how we met. And you know what? He just, he, I don't know what he did with that watch. And he's a really nice guy. And it's like, I got to break his heart when he comes to me. I'm the guy that's got to be the, right. you know, the grim reaper. And it's like, you know, some, I mean, he's a really nice guy and he trusts me, but it's like, what do you do in that situation? You know, I mean, you send something out. I mean, who knows what it looked like beforehand? You know, I know what it looks like now. Right. And it's like, you're going to get murdered on it. You know, you're done. You're, you're cooked. And I don't know. It, it's just, I don't know. The whole market right now is full of a lot of fringe players and a lot of new guys. And there's nothing wrong with new guys coming in. It's just that they have to, they have to pay their dues. You know, you know how you pay your dues? You buy something really crappy for a lot of money and that's how you learn. And then you don't do it again. I did it. I'm sure you did. Yeah, I mean, we all we, did. We've all done we've it. All but done that's it. like, without a doubt, the best way to learn. And you're not going to make those mistakes, yeah. you know, more than once. And if you do, this probably isn't for you, to be <laughs> I've made, honest. I've made those mistakes. Uh, and you know what's funny? It's that with social media and the internet, I mean, in the 90s, you didn't have all of this. It was all face to face. You had to look at it, you had to make a decision right then and there whether you're going to spend your money on something. And we made mistakes. You know, that's how we learned. And we made huge scores. That's how we learned too. And today it's like everybody's comparing photographs and everybody's looking on websites and comparing pricing and everybody wants something for 50 bucks less. And it's like, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for that stuff. I just don't. If you know what you want and I have it, know what you want. And this is what, you, what it's going to cost you, you know, and that's what it is. And the people that I deal with are some of the best people on the planet because they understand that. They get it, you know, and I'll pay, I'll, you know leave money on the table just to have a really nice, easy deal. Because when you start having hard deals, it makes this more <laughs> unpleasant than it can be. You know, it, it's obviously pleasant. It's obviously fun because we've been doing it for so long. But, I mean, you don't want to get into one of these deals. I mean, I was reading on, on Flippers where this guy, uh, I, it sounded like the guy went to FedEx with a Rolex box and handed it to FedEx and said, it's an expensive watch, please ship it. And they put tape all over the outer box and shipped it. And now the guy's giving the guy a problem. It's like, how do you deal with these maniacs? You know, are you crazy? You know, I mean, I understand, you know, you explain to them exactly. When I have to have someone ship something to me, I'm giving them like this detailed explanation of how it has to be shipped and where the tape has to go on the box and how everything has to go when you drop it off. It's got to have a receipt and you got to make sure the receipt is the same serial number, same serial, same tracking number that's on the box. And this, this is, you know, my neurotic way, but it works because you don't know these guys at FedEx. They'll pull out a ticket that was, you know, from the guy before you, you take it home and that package gets lost. You're done. You right. know, you're paying for a package. But yeah. I but they're, I mean, they're, and that's not to diminish this, but there've always been these challenges, right? From the yeah. early days, the early forums. Yeah. I mean, Back in that day, what? How did you even get online, right? You were taking the little AOL disc or you'd take your free disc and dial pop up. it in. You know, Arthur dial had dial-up for years, you know? He really did. And I was really proud of him when he went to cable. I was proud of you, Art. Really. <laughs> but the, during that era, it was like dial-up, right? You'd yeah. have to wait for the images to load. And, and how would you pay for stuff? Money orders, right? <gasps> um, there was U-Bid. There was bid pay. There was PayPal, of course. Which was in its infancy. It was in then. its infancy. UBID and BidPay were like the beginning of eBay, like in the late 90s. and Well, it had to be the late 90s because I was in Brooklyn. And you trusted people with money orders, you know? And, <laughs> you know, for a lot of that stuff that we did, I mean, people are genuinely honest you right. know, for the most part. I've noticed that. And I always like to trust people. Like if, you know, if somebody's sending me money for a dial or something, I'm like, listen, I'm going to ship it to you. You know, I'll invoice you. Just send me a check. And they're like, oh, you don't know me. I'm like, you know what? If you're going to beat me for a dial, it's going to cost you more than it's going to cost me because one day you're going to want something else for me and I'm going to remember that you didn't pay me. And everybody pays. They do. It's, you know, it, it's the guys that, it's never the guys that you don't trust that screw you. It's always the guys that you trust. 
you know? And those are the guys that you got to watch, like guys that, you know, you've seen it recently that have gone under, you know, because the market is really shifting right now. And there's a lot of people that are, you know, <laughs> that are short on cash, heavy on watches, and they've got bills to pay because they have a lifestyle to uphold. And it's dangerous. And you got to be really careful. You, right. You just do. Yeah. I mean, as you said, the market, and we've all alluded to, is constantly changing mm-hmm. and shifting. And it's, you know, it's very easy to, I think, get caught up in the hype and see what's mm-hmm. going on. And it sort of becomes self fulfilling. But having lived through it, obviously more this is for you than me but you know that this goes in cycles like real estate um, like equities you Mm -hmm. know everything else and it's not necessarily looking at where you are today but it's where you think things may be um, you know a year from now two three years from now and um, at times it's like having a vision no one else has or seeing a market where maybe it doesn't exist um, even if it may start out sort of as a means of humor as a joke, which mm-hmm. is really a great segue into the Buckley dial. <laughs> the Buckley dial. It's a wonderful thing, the Buckley dial. So, <laughs> and I have to say, it's all my fault. <laughs> but, you really know, is. The, this is a funny <laughs> topic, right? Because yeah, it's great. those who've, who know you and have chatted with you obviously know one story. And then there yeah. are like a lot of other stories yeah. out there, sort of this folklore yeah. where you'll read online and some people say, oh, this dial is, you know, noted to be named after a famed collector and yeah. this and that. Or, you know, I think someone thought it was named after Jeff Buckley, a musician yeah. as well. That was offensive. And, um, it was. You know, it's it's funny because I think anyone who actually knows you, like, knows, knows. the story, but they know given your personality, like, you're not going to let anyone name something after you. No. You and named nobody it would. after you, right? I named it after me. You know the story. Yeah. So are, are we going to tell the real story here? I mean, I, I have your post on Vintage yeah. Rolex Forum. That was the from, proclamation. It's the proclamation, yeah. excuse me, from February 19th. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the time, you actually referenced this dial, and mm-hmm. some of us do just in jest, because mm-hmm. I think at the time, no one really thought this would yeah. stick. Nobody thought it would stick. Because these painted Roman dials, as mm-hmm. they're known, like... Yeah at the time were not in vogue at all. They were sort of the like pull off dials, you'd throw them into a box. It was like, let's put a champagne dial Mm -hmm. on, let's put diamonds on. And diamonds on it. Let's literally put any dial on this this other than this painted Roman dial. These are like the Newmans back in the set in the um eighties. People didn't want Paul Newman dials in their Daytona. They couldn't stand them. Nobody liked Daytonas back then anyway, but I digress. Yeah, you digress a little. But so anyway, uh, in February of 08, you decided to call these dials Buckley dials. You said that they fit either a non-quick or quick set Mm -hmm. reference, and they were distinguished by uh, painted Roman numerals. Mm -hmm. Um, And at the time, you said that they would come in white, blue, silver, and champagne. Mm Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, in the forum's early days. So you just, it was like a lot more conversational then. Yes. It was like hanging out with your buddies, sort of chatting um, and just having fun. Mm -hmm. So you asked if anyone else had any. And again, in line with your personality, no one knows if you were serious or not. Mm -hmm. But you made the claim that, uh, or you rather promised that these were going to skyrocket in value. Yes, I did. And... um, they you have. S- you said, just look at Newman, Patrizzi. You actually spelled this wrong. What did I spell wrong? You said uh, Meyer. I think there's maybe a Daytona dial. You know, okay. I think you were referencing the Daytona Mayer dial. I was, I was referencing John Mayer because the whole backstory to this, okay, the, the, original, <laughs> the original reason why all of this happened, okay, was back in what what year was that? Oh eight. Yep, we're actually about six days out from the okay. anniversary. From the anniversary, okay. Just before this, John Mayer came on VRF, and listen, John is a really nice guy. He's really not. I mean, just a really nice guy, and I have nothing bad to say about him. I know that there was some you know controversy with Bob a while ago, but they straightened all of that out. And, you know, rightfully so. But, you know, John came on and John had all of those Texas dials. And I remember it was Ed Delgado, who owns DoubleRedSeaDweller.com, 
and Ed is a friend of mine. Ed posts under there. He's like, we should name this the Mayor Dial. And I went, sorry, I went fucking ape shit. Okay? I was like, that is not going to happen on my watch. It just rubbed me the wrong way. It just did. I mean, look, no offense, no hate. Okay? But this is one of these guys that, you know, came onto the scene, has an unlimited checkbook, and he could buy whatever he wants. I mean, we're out there slinging dials on eBay and, you know, doing whatever we have to do, meeting guys in parking lots, uh, you know. And, you know, this guy's gonna come on there with no seniority and he's gonna get a dial named after him? Hell no, that's not happening on my watch. So, so you decided. <laughs> I decided I'm gonna name a dial after myself <laughs> because I'm a big mouth and that's gonna be my form of protest. And here we are today. So was there anything particular like about this style and that nobody drew it liked to you? them and they were cheap. Nobody wanted them. <laughs> and I felt like, you know what, if you're gonna pick something, pick something that abs- that nobody nobody wanted them. I mean, you could never you couldn't sell them. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna put a name to this thing. I'm gonna make it, you know, whatever it is. I had no idea that it would take off. And what wound up happening is people started appreciating them because they were really pretty well made dials. I mean, they are painted on, you know, they're painted Roman dials. Right. And they're very specific and they have very specific characteristics. And th- I, I like them. I always like them. I think I have one somewhere. I mean, that one of the older ones that I have somewhere. And, you know, I always like these dials. And that was how it started. That was the the birth of the Bucky, Buckley dial. Right, and you, you actually went on to post a picture of an example yeah. you had, which was a white dial quick yeah. set with the black mm-hmm. hands. That's correct. And then in August, you had another post about these, so you know we yeah. fast forward about five, six months or so, mm-hmm. and you sort of made a proclamation, um, much, much in the uh, manner that you often do, but you said, you fellows are great. Think what we've accomplished. It sounds like you're like gathering the troops or something. Yeah, well, to I go was, to you war. know who it was on the forums at that time? It was Bernard Bully Beer. Uh, you know, it was who else? It was um, Adriano. It was um, a lot of the guys from overseas liked it because now they, they put a name to something and, you know, they thought it was ridiculous too. We all thought it was right. ridiculous. And I mean, you said we've taken a rather insignificant yeah. dial and brought it to the forefront. Mm-hmm. Um, you said you love that it's a non-sports mm-hmm. watch. It's affordable, which is big. And yeah. I know you're a proponent of that. That's yeah. very important for me is something affordable. Sure. And then you sort of laid out the criteria at the time as well, mm-hmm. which you said a Buckley dial must be painted black champagne or white roman markers on white champagne black blue or a very rare gray background Mm -hmm. and it must have black or white uh buckley hands Mm -hmm. that really finish out the look so to speak um so it's interesting because at this time you sort of formalized what a buckley dial Mm -hmm. was and then over the years we've seen more examples come about you know there's obviously like the classic white, mm-hmm. the classic champagne, blue, which is very desirable. Yeah. Um, and then you see like interesting colors, like a yeah. gray you alluded to. They're, yeah. they're taupe dials the I've one that seen. you're wearing. And, you know, I have this one, which I'd only seen one of yeah, before, which is actually like a mustard shantung yeah. dial on a quick set sapphire crystal yeah. watch. Crazy. Um, and this this whole thing sort of, you know, picked up steam. I can't mm-hmm. tell you how many times I've seen people online or on mm-hmm. forums. On share, Craigslist. Craigslist calling them Buckley <laughs> yeah, dials. It's nuts. You know, sharing pictures. <laughs> and, like, there's this, as with any other watch, there's this great pride in it. But, um, you know, people, like, really look out for prime Buckley dials. Yeah. It seems we much... Do. Much less common now when you will find the matching white hands. Yeah. Um, on a blue. On blue. Or black or gray. Um, you know, the, the black is obviously less common now on yeah. the, you know, four-digit calibers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, the thing I find fun is there's always this discovery like this watch I have mm-hmm. or others you see and you sort of start to see them become uncovered or come out yeah. of woodwork. Um I don't know if you, you know, have any insight as to, like, where most of them originated or so forth. I know 
I see a lot come out of like Latin and South America. Really? But interestingly, a lot of the ones in the silver medal mm-hmm. uh, don't have the colored numeral, or yeah. rather the colored hands. Colored hands, yeah. The hands match mm-hmm. the color of the medal, where yeah. ones I see, you know, maybe with U.S. papers or from yeah. Europe or Asia seem to have, mm-hmm. you know, the black hands the black or the hands white hands. The white hands, yeah. Um, Is that in line with what you see? It's in line with what I've seen over the years, but, you know, it's Rolex. There's no rhyme or reason. You know, we can sit here and, and, you know, try to put it all in a box. And, you know, it's like we don't know. Right. Nobody knows. They don't even know. And if they do know, they're not telling us. Right. And I think that's a good point to bring up about these and in general is I think today everyone gets so caught up in Mm -hmm. all this minutia and all these details, which Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, they're very important, but... Even five, six years ago, no one was studying it to the level they yeah. are now. And they're obviously studying it for many reasons. There's a lot more money involved. Mm-hmm. The collectability is at all time highs. Yeah. But as you said, um, unless you were literally there assembling the watches um, yeah. in the factory, which at the time, you know, it's they not... They worth anything back then. They were just worth a Rolex watch. Just like a lot of these guys with like which mark red dial goes in which numbered case. We all made that up back in the day just based on what we bought and sold. And the majority of, you know, mark one dials came in this serial and mark two came in that serial and this should be in that. We did all of that. There's no rhyme or reason to that. I mean, it's Rolex for God's sake. That watchmaker in Switzerland didn't care what dial it was as long as he was getting paid at the end of the week, you know, and it went through quality control and he wouldn't get slammed for it. You know, nobody knew, nobody cared. And now we're sitting over here, you know, trying to categorize it all. And by doing that, I mean, we set the market by doing that, yes. But, I mean, on another note, it's like we, you know, we take away from what it really is. It's a, it's a watch that is made, it's a tool watch for the most part. It's a watch that can go underwater. It's a watch that can, you know, time a race car. It's a watch that can, you know, dive to the bottom of the sea and do all of these things and, you know, time a yacht, whatever the heck you do with them. And, you know, we want to put them into this category of like, you know, these highly valuable, collectible, this and that. They were made to be worn, you know? I mean, like this. This is made to be worn. You could beat the hell out of this thing, and I usually do. Right, and that's, uh, you know, Steve McQueen. <laughs> yeah. Or, well, that's referred to Steve yeah, McQueen. Yeah, I don't like that. You don't like no, that? No, I don't like that. Yeah, see, Arthur doesn't like that well, either. Well, th- this is an explorer, too, then, we'll okay, say. Thank you so much. But, like, um, like, at the time when that was new, what did that call couple hundred bucks. Right. So it was made. It yeah. had utility and right. he wore it as a watch. And exactly. I think that's an important point. I mean, we're, we're selling the watches. Most important point. We're selling watches today. And you hinted to it or alluded to it earlier is sort of investments and mm-hmm. so forth. And, you know, I know I've heard you say it over the years and I'm of a similar mindset that someone comes to you and they say, what's a great investment? And like my Bitcoin. That's well, what I, I, I don't know anything about Bitcoin either, but and mining or any of that. But if they're asking me that question about a watch, not my guy. Right. Definitely not my guy. I mean, I, I tell, and I assume you do the same thing. I tell people, find a watch that you like mm-hmm. and that you're going to love, you're going to enjoy wearing exactly. it, and that you can form a connection with. Mm-hmm. And that's first and foremost the most important thing. Mm-hmm. You know, the rest will come with it if you're yeah. buying it at the right, right price. And you're buying it because the conditions mm-hmm. there, it's good quality. You're buying it from a reputable mm-hmm. person. And over time, it's going to take care of itself. Yeah. And which that's I, what it does. Which I think is, you, you know. You have a lot of patience to say all of that stuff. See, I'm old. I just you're forgot young. what I said. Yeah, I, well, you know, I, 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 I kind of like think. Blacked out. What, you, what you basically said was, you know, you gave them the explanation. I don't have time to give you an explanation for an investment. I'm not here. I'm not your investment advisor. Okay, I'm a guy who's going to sell you a watch. Okay, over history, these things have always gone up. Since the, I cannot think of one Rolex list price that over 10, 15 years goes down. I don't think it exists. Okay, maybe Cellini's, and even that, I don't think you know. I don't think they go down to a point where they're garbage. You know, and that's like the lowest form of life in Rolex land. You know, I, I take sort of offense to that. I no, happen to I, like the Cellini. I love the Cellini too. I'm talking about as as something that you're going to put money into. Okay, 
you're buying basically for gold value. Right. If you're but buy you know what? You're buying a watch that you love the mm -hmm. look of it. You're paying Absolutely. the gold value or a little more and you're yeah. going to keep it for five, ten years. So That's the way to buy it. But most of these cats go out there and buy it like on some crazy site and they're going to pay three times what it's really worth. And then when it doesn't appreciate in six months, they're coming to me and I'm going to break their heart. That's what I'm saying. Do you enjoy that? No, I really don't. I don't. Unless it's somebody I don't like. <laughs> If I don't like them, then it's like I love – like guys on the street that come to me and they're like, oh, you want to buy this? You know, I bought this six months ago and you know, I bought this Gilt GMT and I paid $45,000 for it. I'm like, how much is that $15,000 watch in that condition? You know, it's like did you look at the condition of this thing? You know, your case is polished out. Your insert sucks. Your dial is jacked. Your hands are the wrong hands. It's like, excuse me? You paid $45,000? Here, I'll give you fifteen. dollars Right. You know, and I enjoy it. Makes me feel You good. revel on that, don't you? Oh, I love it. I love it because these guys shouldn't be in the business to begin with. They want to play, you know, they want to piss in the tall weeds with the big dogs. Get ready, okay, because you're going to take a haircut. You will, you know, and that's what a lot of these guys are doing right now. They went out there. They bought up all of these vintage watches because they have tons of dirty money. I don't want to say dirty money, but they've got all kinds of money from whatever it is that they've done all their lives. God knows what. And they're putting it into these, you know, vintage watches like they're Apple stock. And it's like... Apple stock is Apple stock, okay? It can go up, it can go down. You look at a, a, a little sheet that says, you know, you don't have to look at the corners like a baseball card or look at the printing. You know, when you're buying a vintage watch, you have to look at that. You have to know what you're buying. You have to understand the criteria of what a guy like you or me is going to say when you come to sell it to me. And when you come to sell it to me and it's jacked, <laughs> you know, if I like you, I'll let you off easy, you know, like I did the other day. But if you come to me and you're one of these guys that, you know, beat me out of buying something or whatever, it's like I'm going to take I'm gonna take great pleasure in letting you know that you screwed up. And these guys don't care. It doesn't matter to them. You know, it's like they'll just throw it in a, you know, throw it in a box and, you know, they don't care. And that's my problem with a lot of it. You know, it's like they don't really understand it. I mean, you know, I can't stand watches, but I really do like them. You know, I like them because I know everything about them and I can't sing or dance. So I have to do something with them or else what am I going to do for a living? Work at Home Depot, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, I don't want to lift stuff up. I don't know how to drive a forklift. So what am I supposed to do? You know, and these guys, you know, they're, they're just jumping into it on spec and have fun. You know, good luck with that. You know, you're looking at pictures, buying stuff from guys you don't know. Okay. You could only spend so much money on bad stuff before it starts to bite you. Right. And that's, you know, that's sort of what happened mm -hmm. sort of in this era we talked about yep. where you get a glut in the market and only the prime mm -hmm. sort of creme de la creme starts moving anything that yeah. doesn't have provenance or isn't really mm -hmm. nice and original. That's right. Um, just sits and it really dies, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I think we're starting to see maybe some rumblings up again. But the other thing you sort of alluded to is there is a lot of product out there. People are buying it for these high prices. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of opportunity and there are a lot of great people out there, honest yeah, guys. Who, absolutely. You know, you said you're sort of like the Grim Reaper. You tear mm -hmm. it apart and you give them the bad news. But then there are people who are looking for someone to be honest, who they can yeah. trust. And you have a lot of guys who come back to you. There are a lot of guys Always. who are friends with who come back to them because they know them, they trust them, they mm -hmm. know that if they ever need or want to sell yeah. or trade back in, they can come to them and it's going to be fair. That's right. And they may come to them too because, you know, they know they're buying something. could be 20% more than something else out there, but they know it's going to be nice. They yeah. know it's going to be correct. And that, that person's not going anywhere. They've been there for five, that 10 years. That extra 20% sometimes is the difference between a watch really holding up in a down market or not. That extra money that you spend. And I'm not big on the, spending the extra money on certain things. You know me. I'm really critical with stuff when it comes across my desk. It's got to be – if it's going to be right, it's got to be really right in order to pay more money for it because I'm just like that. I mean you throw parts at me, I'll buy them all. I don't even have to look at them. Just here. What's the bag? How much is it? I'll take it. Right. But watches, I'm funny like that. I want the watches to be what they're supposed to be. And a lot of these guys just don't go that way. They just don't. Mm -hmm. But that's their problem, not yours, not mine. Sort, of, sort of going back to the people interacting with you because I've witnessed some of this. And, <laughs> uh, you know, to say you get great pleasure out of this, I think, would be a vast understatement. Vast understatement. But um, there have been numerous texts I've seen shared with me, phone calls, requests, mm -hmm. where 
you actually have people contacting you about the Buckley Dials. Yes. Like wanting you to guy today. <laughs> write a letter like yeah. certifying this Buckley Dial. <laughs> <laughs> or you want someone to, like, take a picture with them when they come by the watch. Um, th- things like that, which, like... Yeah. It's I had to do a video. I got 500 bucks for that video. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, that's Christian over there from Theo and Harris. Happy fifth anniversary, Theo and Harris. That's my boy, Christian. And Christian came to me, what was it, about a year ago? And he's like, John, you got to do me a favor. I need you to come and do a video for somebody. I'm selling a Buckley dial to, you know, this young man. It was his graduation and he is just really super psyched to get it. And his mom wanted, you know, a letter. So I said, a letter? Well, Christian said, a letter? I'll do a video with Buckley. He's my friend. And I was like, yeah, all right. And we met at exit 130, 123 by the Sunoco station and we shot a video. And this young man has a video of me and I, I love doing it. It was fun. You know, because that's a pure organic type deal. Okay, the kid likes the watch. Okay, he likes the story with the watch. If I can make it more fun for him, great. You know, that's terrific. I'll do it all day. Right, and it's that's, fun. That's what's fun. Yeah. Like, I think and needed because at times I think we all take this or many take this like way too serious. And mm-hmm. as I said, you. You tend to get caught up in all this stuff when, at the end of the day, it is, again, about wearing the watch and enjoying it and having fun. And, you know, I've seen people, like, come from overseas just to see you and shake your hand or, like... What about taking pictures with me? Oh, you didn't even let me get to the selfies. Well, I was hoping you would get there. And, like, sometimes you'll want to shoot, like, two or three. Oh, yeah. And make faces and all that. absolutely. You know, it's fun, and that's what Mm -hmm. it should be about. It should be fun, you know? It should be. And a lot of the people that come over there and do that... I mean, whether they, you know, have bought from me or not, a lot of them are just nice guys that I know on the internet and they just want to come and whether they buy stuff or not from me, it's like, it's irrelevant, you know? Right. You're coming over there and it's just, you know, oh, I want to take a picture, you know, fine, that's cool, let's go. You know? Right. So it's it, nice. It seems like a lot of, you know, the Buckley dials, but watches in general mm-hmm. are like, they're a great way to connect people. Absolutely. Which I think we sort of become lost in at times, but yeah. we get caught up in the numbers, you, you know, get, you get caught up in the numbers, mm-hmm. you get caught up in everything else when yeah. it like end of the day, it's the relationships. And right. like, I've seen a few people over the years who are like, oh my gosh, this is so-and-so we've been friends on the forum mm-hmm. for like 15 years <laughs> and you can talk you know some of yeah. them are here but yeah you talk about these stories and like <laughs> emails where you may email yeah. two or three times over yeah. the course of a night sure like you may like butt heads like this oh, for weeks at a time you may not want to talk to this person mm-hmm. but at the end of the day like you're still friends of course good friends and then they show up and you're like oh my gosh i'm actually meeting them in person yeah this is so cool oh man it's you know it's the nature of the business you know it's like you're providing something that makes them happy you know and that's the pure buyer whether they're happy because they're getting something that's you know valuable monetarily or valuable to them just to have it on their wrist and look at it every day. You know, that's what they want. You know, they want to be able to look at their wrist and say, wow, I enjoy this. Uh, You know me, I hate vintage watches. I hate to wear vintage watches. I haven't really worn a vintage watch since like 2010, 2011, when they started getting crazy money, right. it just didn't make sense to wear a Newman, you know? It just didn't. Like when you jump in a swimming pool with a Newman back in the day. And they've done like, that, you know? You didn't, you didn't worry about it when they were 30 grand. When they were like 90 and 100 grand, it's like, oh, you know, you don't want to, you, you know that it's going to be okay. And it's just like, you know what? Just eh, let me wear something else. And I, you know, I wear the Daytona that I got from you for, I wear it every day. And since I got this, I kind of like this. This is the only vintage watch that I like to wear. Well, you know? yeah, I mean, other than the Buckley dial, you have you wear occasionally. Every once in a while. Not lately, though. I haven't. I've seen you wear more than the more than. I, I love the Buckley dial. I know. I well, how could you cool not? Dis- you actually get to hang around me all the time. You lucky person. Well, that's why I'm starting to develop a distaste for the Buckley <laughs> oh, dial, okay. actually. But, <laughs> um, you know. But no, they're, they're great watches. They're really fun, jokes aside. Um, and, and it's cool because we do see so many people, as yeah. I said, showing these different ones. And mm-hmm. like they're finally starting to like pop up randomly in auctions online yeah. or catalogs and things like that, which is well, really neat. Do, I know that um, 
I've been speaking with a friend of ours. I'm not going to mention his name because he asked me not to. And uh, we're going to do, uh, you know, some of the Buckley dials that I've got, that I've had for a while. So you have, like, a stash? Uh, yeah, I probably do. <laughs> I probably do, somewhere. I just have to look in the office. That'll be fun. Well, to, like, <laughs> from what I've witnessed and heard, you're not the most organized person, no, so, like... No, I'm very disorganized. This could happen soon. Yeah. This could be five years. Who Listen, knows? I never lose anything. I misplace a lot of stuff. I know where they are, and they're there. And um, we're going to put them in, uh, in an auction, and we're going to have some fun with it and see what happens. So that ought to be good. So what, I mean, what, what role are you having in this? Like, um, I don't know. I'm just going to be Buckley. Just going to be a personality. Just going to be Buckley, like I'm doing tonight. Isn't it great? I don't know. How do you think you're doing? I think I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> yeah? How could I not? You just talk about watches, right? I was just sitting right? talking to you. This is what we do all day long. And you're being really nice to me, too. You haven't called me names or anything. No, I, I agree I'm, not to. I, I'm I mean. really, I'm, I'm shocked at this. I mean, I know Buckley back there is like looking at this like, when is he going to call him like stupid or, hey, you dummy and dumbass and this and that, like we do all day Oof. long. Yeah. I'm, I'm just happy that I'm not riding in a car with you today. Hey, you almost had to hit a FedEx truck today and I wasn't driving, all right? So you watch. So I got you through monsoon, than- monsoon-like conditions twice. And you made it there safely. I did make it safely there. Yes, you did. So mm-hmm. coming up, you've got some Buckley project you mentioned on. Yeah. Mentioned about. We always have Buckley. Anything projects. else going on? You're uh, working on um, on the horizon. Working on getting out of New York. Yeah. To be honest with you, yeah. You know, New York is. I don't know. Our lease is up in what's today's date? In about eighteen days. It's leap year, so it's 18 days. And uh, we're thinking about, you know, moving down here and either setting up somewhere or another. I'm not sure. Or maybe just staying in New York for a little while, for another year. I got to see, you know. But it's uh, it's always an adventure. You know, I mean, New York is not like it used to be. You know that. Right. It's more I mean, or less, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you know, paying for parking and all of this other stuff and driving in and out, which is a pain in the neck. And, you know, it could be a lot less stressful. You know, I'm getting older, Carl. I'm getting older. I know. When I first met you, yeah, your hair I was, was old. <laughs> well, yeah, you had, uh, you know, a little lighter hair. Yeah. Well, I had more hair. lighter, you had more hair. Yes. Um, you have lost a significant amount of weight yes, I since have. I first met and you. This which was before is I went vegan. Yeah, I, I mean, imagine now, right? Hell yeah, yeah. This is the hardest. But thing. yeah, it's it's changed a lot, and I think yeah. it's continuing to change. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I think there will be a lot of changes. But one thing you talked about, sort of, is people keep coming back to you for a reason. They keep coming yeah. back to the people they know, and I think there's a lot there that mm-hmm. could be uh, helpful as well. Like some of this continued, like helping people in education, which I know you said you don't like doing, but. When it's like your people, you're happy to do it, which is Listen, if really somebody cool. is spending money with me, I will educate them. I will s- explain, you know, but you get these random people who are very self-serving. And, you know, it's like, oh, uh, how much is this worth? Or, oh, what would you pay for this? I'm like, are you selling it to me? Okay, well, you know, I haven't bought it yet. I was like, you know what? When you buy it, you let me know. Okay, oh, well, I don't know what to pay for it. I'm like, I don't know either because I'm not dealing with the person that you're dealing with. So, you know, if you buy something and bring it to me, I'll put a number on it. And I'll do that maybe once or twice. And if you don't sell me something after that once or twice, then don't come back. Right. Because then you're just using me to put a number on something. And I'm real quick to not put a number on things for people. Real quick. You see it. Sure. Like we get guys all day long. Oh, we're, oh, how much, how much do I pay for this? I'm like, I don't know. Hmm, 50 bucks. You know, give me a counter offer. <laughs> oh, 20,000. It's like, okay, well, figure out somewhere in the middle and let me know a price and I'll say yes or no. Right. You know, and, and short of that, I'm not getting involved in it because it's just too much, too much work. You know, right. too much work. It's so much easier to deal with people that you deal with and they say, okay, this is this much money. It's like, okay, here you go. Here's a check. So much easier. Sure. You know, and there's no, no mystery. There's no games. You know, that's the thing. Everybody wants to, play these games because they're worried they're going to leave money on the table. And you know what? If you're not leaving money on the table, then what the hell am I doing buying something from you? You know? It's like, what do you think I'm here for? You know, I'm not here to like, you know, to make your day. I'm here to make mine. Right. And that, you know, that's, I think how a lot of people started. I Mm -hmm. know I did is 
there was money left on the table, and the idea was you want to sell someone something where they're either going to buy it at the right price and mm-hmm. wear it and enjoy it, or if it's someone else, there's a little room left if they want to. Well, you know what's interesting? And, and Mike asked me if Ike was coming tonight. we got to get Ike on here. Ike gave me the, the, the greatest line of all time. He said, John, when both people are dissatisfied at the end of the deal, it's a fair deal. And I, I looked at him like, what are you, nuts? And then I started thinking about it. It's like if both parties are not happy with the deal, then it's fair. Then it makes sense for both parties. Right. You know? And it's like once you get your head around that, it's like, you know what? It doesn't, not every deal is a home run. I mean, we hit home runs, but you know what? For the most part, we're hitting base hits. You know, or sometimes we're striking out, or sometimes we're walking, or sometimes we're on the bench. Right. You know, but, you know, you have to earn somehow, you know, and when we're earning out there, it's not always, you know, like they, everybody wants, I, I saw a post the other day, it's like, oh, you know, uh, when am I going to make $7,000 on a Rolex? I was like, gee, I don't know, when am I going to make $7,000 on a Rolex? Not that I haven't in my life, but it's like, you know, you just started out over here and, you know, you're looking to hit these kind of numbers. You're going to hit that kind of number, and if that customer that you sold the watch to comes back to you and says, you know what, I need to sell this watch back to you, you're going to break his heart. And then he's going to come to me, and I'm going to break his heart even more. Right. And you're going to look like a jerk. You know, And that's the problem out there right now because everybody's looking to squeeze every last dollar out of stuff. And uh, Listen, have fun. Well, it, it seems like you certainly have a lot to say about that. Yes, I do. Um, and many other things. So I'm... I'm excited, uh, you know, to see the Buckley Report 2.0 continue mm-hmm. and um, see what else you want to talk. And well, you know what I want to talk future. about. I know what you want to talk about. I, I asked if you would wear your really cool blue uh, suede loafers, but you agreed no. not to. No, my blueberry loafers? Uh, well, I mean, look, we are going to, you know, address the blueberry inserts and, you know, we spoke with Arthur and, right Arthur? We spoke with Arthur and we are going to do the definitive final word, blueberry post, in the next couple of weeks. And let everybody think what they want, you know? I think it's pretty obvious. You well, know? it sounds like you're uh, ready and willing to discuss this topic. I was born uh, ready. Well, somewhat ready. With others, you know, who have the experience with this with you going back many, many years. So I think everyone who, looks Arthur? forward to it. Uh, Arthur's going to wear his uh, Eagle Beak uh, 5512 or something. I got it on. Yeah, I know you do. Um, he's going to wear his Eagle Beak, and he actually took the plastic wrap off the watch before we shoot. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's like, that's big, okay? That's just really big, people. Okay, and I know Arthur's sitting over there. He's trying to like hide in his chair, but you know what? When you're up here on camera, it's gonna be loads of fun, Art. I can't wait. Can't wait to test your knowledge on these blueberries because you were the person who actually did all the research with me. Yeah. You know, and bought the original lot. So yeah, we're gonna do that, and it's gonna be fun. Well, I look forward to seeing and hearing what you all have to say. Thank you for letting me sit in this you're very chair. Welcome. Thank you for sitting in the you. chair. And, uh, can't wait to see what uh, lineup of special guests you have to <laughs> discuss many interesting topics moving forward. We definitely will have some special guests. We definitely will touch on some very interesting topics. And uh, as always, it's a pleasure. And uh, we'll be on the street tomorrow. So we'll, you'll be... Well, if anyone's in New York tomorrow, you can see John Buckley, yes. 66 West, 47th Street. Yeah. For, the uh, last, for the next 18 days... He, he's going to be thinking about lunch from 11 to about 1.30 when he may or may not order, so don't bother him. But otherwise, he looks forward to seeing you. Thank you very much, Thank Carl you. Cullen. It has been a pleasure, as usual. And uh, 